Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. My name is Cheryl Jennison DeProza, and today we're going to be discussing back to school mics and how to achieve great sound on a budget. But before we get into that, just a few items of housekeeping. First of all, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for on demand viewing. Usually it takes us about a week or so to get it ready for on demand viewing, but once it's edited and ready, it will be viewable at sure.com slash webinar. Once again, that is sure.com slash webinar. And that's a great place to go for all of our past existing webinars. Um, we have a lot of great topics covered there, a lot of great audio topics at sure.com slash webinar. So feel, feel free to go there, check, of all, check out our archives. You can also see any upcoming webinars we have there, sure.com slash webinar. Second of all, as we go through the session today, if you have any questions, please feel free to type those into the question pane. Um, I believe in the web app, you just need to look for a question mark and a circle and click on that. Um, if you're using the GoToWebinar control panel, just look for a gray bar with an orange box with a white arrow in it. Click on that orange box with a white arrow to expand the toolbar and you should see the Q&A section. Ask any questions you have, but please note we will be holding on those until the end of the session. All right, that wraps up the housekeeping. Let's get into the good stuff. As I said, today we're gonna to be discussing back to school mics and how to achieve great sound on a budget. And if we go to the next slide here, I can introduce our presenters. Today I'm joined by two of my friends and colleagues, Ms. Laura Davidson and Yuri. I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce your last name, Yuri. Um, <laughs> probably should have asked you that before we hit go live, but hey, that's where we are. Um, Laura and Yuri are fantastic. They're in our market development team and they know all sorts of great stuff about capturing great audio on all of our great products. So they've got lots of great information today. And if we go to the next slide, we can take a look at our agenda. We're gonna to start today with some application overview. Then we're gonna do an overview of microphone types, um, take into account some acoustic considerations, some placement recommendations. And then as I mentioned, we will dive into the Q&A. And so without further ado, take it away, Laura and Yuri. Well, first we've got our exciting poll, Cheryl. So if you wanna ah. put that up. Great, let me just I'm pull gonna take the over the screen. Give me just a second here and we are launching a poll. All right, the poll is in progress. So we'd like to know <laughs> what is the main audio problem you're trying to solve? Um, do you wanna sound better for your online students or during meetings? Do you wanna sound better when recording at home? Do you wanna sound better when recording your voice? Or you just have too many audio problems that you don't even know where to begin? So please take a minute and answer this poll question. And the responses are slowly trickling in. This helps us know kind of what to talk about too when we're doing the webinar, because we have all kinds of things we can discuss, but we want to make sure we're giving you the most relevant info. Awesome. I don't know, Yuri and Laura, which of which of these would be your main audio problems? Hmm. Sound better when recording at home is always a constant struggle in my room that is full of angles and hard surfaces. <laughs> I yeah. totally understand that. <laughs> For me, the same. I, I do a lot of mobile recordings, so I'm always in a different room, like on a weekly basis. So that's a big one. Yeah, yeah. That is a big one. All right. We're almost to 70 percent here i'm just going to give it one more moment all right i think everybody that's voted is going to vote so let me just close this poll and let me share the results with everybody so it looks like the key thing people are looking for is to sound better for their online students or during meetings which i think means you're definitely in the right place here yes. with uh tied in second sounding better when recording at home and recording a voice so Fortunately, we have people that not many people that have too many audio problems. So that's a that's a good sign. But I think we're going to be able to help you kind of resolve all of these in today's session. Correct? Absolutely. All right. I'm going to hide these results and give you guys control. Fantastic. All right. Am I still sharing? Yes. Yes, okay. you are. Great. All right. So what we thought we'd talk about first and foremost is some of the applications that you're probably experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis, just so we can kind of hone in on what is going to be the best solution for you. But there's also some challenges that Yuri is going to describe and some solutions on how to fix those. But primarily what we're focusing on is using Zoom calls, recording at home, podcasting, uh, performing on stage, um, and instrument miking. We're going to focus primarily though on those conference calls. If you're teaching remotely, if you're learning remotely, this is what we're going to kind of focus on mostly and, and mainly, and then we'll touch a little bit more on the home recording side or podcasting. 
So what we thought we'd kind of start off with is just a brief overview of the types of microphones that are out there. Primarily the dynamic condenser and ribbon, but when you're using a mic every day, if you're using a ribbon every day, good on you, you're pretty special. But normally we're going with a dynamic or a condenser as our main two types. Yuri and I are both using dynamic microphones uh, and that is this guy right here. So we're using the MV7, but a dynamic microphone uh, is better for untreated environments, which we'll get into a little bit more deeply in a bit because of how they're physically designed. So they have a thin diaphragm or membrane and it's attached to a coil of wire that surrounds a magnet. So when you speak or talk or sing or perform into it, it moves the membrane, it moves that coil around the magnet, creates an electromagnetic field, and then that's how you get your acoustic energy transferred over to an electrical signal. And then that carries down the cable into your audio interface, or in this case, a USB cable, and that's how you get that sound amplified. So that's why it's better for a room that is not so treated, as opposed to something like a condenser microphone. Condenser microphones are typically used in the studio or more controlled environments because of how they're designed. They have a thin backplate that's an electrically charged backplate and a super thin diaphragm. And that backplate uses something called phantom power. So instead of having that magnet and the coil and all that physical matter to move, it's much easier to move the diaphragm and have that electrical field created. Um, so that way you talk or sing into it and it captures all the nuances and details, which is great if you have a treated space. If you don't, it can be a little bit um, more prone to picking up things like HVAC or the keyboard tapping or basically anything. So that's why we recommend using a, a dynamic microphone when you're in a less than perfect space. Um, but just quickly, just so we cover all the bases in terms of the three types of mics that we talked about, the ribbon microphone is actually the oldest of the three. And it works similarly to a dynamic mic in that it has a magnet and that's suspended between two poles. This is a very, very thin piece uh, for the diaphragm. Ours is made out of rosvalate, which is called the ribbon of the microphone. It's suspended between those poles. And so when you speak or talk into it or sing, it's gonna vibrate that back and forth, create that electrical charge. And that's how you get that down the mic. So very similar to your dynamic microphones. But these are better at capturing the natural details because they take a little bit less physical energy to move. Am I missing anything there, Yuri? I think I think I got those. No, you got it. Rock and roll. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of the physics of how the microphones actually move. But now we, we want to talk about what you're going to be doing in a real life application. So when you're recording, whether you're broadcasting, teaching, learning, however you're using these microphones, it's very important that you choose the proper tools that you have available. And not only that, it's important to know where to position this microphone. Many of us rely on the microphones that are built into our devices or our computers, which is fine in a pinch, but you're going to introduce a lot more room noise because that microphone is meant to grab any and everything so that it can be heard, so that you can be heard, but it's not going to block out any sounds or resonant frequencies, which Yuri is going to talk about a little bit later on. So that's why it's beneficial to choose the right tool, namely a microphone and a set of headphones or earphones, which I'm monitoring in right now, so that you can not only hear your students, but you can also hear yourself. And so that's why it's important to have the right tools for your acoustic situation. And with, if you're recording at home or talking or doing anything from home, there's a few enemies to think about. So Yuri, why don't you take this one over and run us through these? Yeah, so we to. have the parallel walls as our first yeah. enemy. So yeah, as, as a preface to this, I wanted the, the main reason we're talking about the enemy of home recording and acoustics. So if, if you're in this webinar and you're going to be recording music at home or in some other room, or if you're presenting to a group of students or whatever, these, these problems that I'm going to talk about are kind of universal. Like regardless of what room you're in, regardless of what you're trying to do, these are things that are gonna be affecting the quality of your sound. So with that going through, uh, so yes, parallel walls. I'm gonna talk about parallel <laughs> walls quite <laughs> uh, uh, in a little bit more detail, but this is something that no one ever really thinks about unless they like pay attention to acoustics at all. Uh, but I will demonstrate that this is a, th a thing that happens in every single room, including uh, this room right here, you're actually hearing the effect of parallel walls on my voice right now. You just don't know it, uh, but you will. Um, so that's parallel walls. And then the next one is going to be uh, essentially reverberation. When you have 
uh, a room that is not a studio space. And I'm assuming the vast majority of the people that are watching this webinar are people that are speaking into a microphone or recording music in a microphone in a space that's not a studio space. So the downside of that is that you're gonna have all sorts of materials that are not conducive to good sound, uh, specifically drywall with paint on it. Uh, glass tends to reflect sound in very, very unpleasant ways. Uh, there's a couple of other things that I'll go through, uh, but all of those problematic reflections get picked up by your microphone as well. And then finally, we've got noise. This is the hardest thing to actually control because uh, it takes, there's some very, very expensive solutions to get rid of noise unless you can actually physically get rid of the thing that's making the noise. Um, unfortunately, I'm in a house. So this is, this is my house uh, in the Chicago suburbs. This, is not, this house is not built for sound and I purposefully did not set up this room uh, to be used for recording so that you could hear the imperfections in the room. You know, I, I have thin walls in my house. I have single pane windows. Uh, we have air conditioning and heating and we have all sorts of other, if somebody, thank goodness, nobody's mowing the lawn right now because if somebody was <laughs> mowing their lawn, I would hear it really, really clearly out of this window that's in front of me. So um, those are all that's things that we have to think about. If you um, use your microphone, your MV7, it would block it out, but we'll talk absolutely. about that. Later. <laughs> um, but it would still annoy me in the room. <laughs> yes, um, fair. But yeah, you know, and, and when I do recordings, I record in churches, I record in all sorts of people's homes, living room concerts, all sorts of really, really interesting things where uh, I have to think about noise all the time because a lot of times those are things that I cannot control. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So digging into those a little bit more deeply, uh, we were going to kind of go over reverberation and what that actually is, because I think a lot of people kind of misdiagnose it or they'll call it echo or something else. But reverberation is is what naturally occurs in a space, depending on, well, actually any space that you're in. Yeah, so, I mean, ahead. unless you're like downtown or in like a mountain range, you're probably not going to hear a natural <laughs> echo. Um, but you know, when, when we think when we think reverberations, we, we you know we usually think of something like this, where I'm talking into the mic and there's something on the wall of wall of reflections. But right. truth be told, most of us are not going to be recording in uh, cathedrals that sound like this. So, um, but that doesn't mean that reverberation does not exist. Actually, this room right here has uh, reverberation. So literally, every single sound you hear, if somebody's speaking to you in a room then you are hearing a combination of their voice and the, the reflections off the walls in the room. Same thing if you're recording a guitar or if you're recording somebody's voice or recording piano, you're still gonna be hearing the instruments and the reflections off the walls at the same time. Right, and there's three things that contribute to what creates the reverb. Yeah. Yeah, the biggest one is how big the room is. So if, if the room is bigger, you're going to get more, I, I'm not going to say more reverb, but you're going to get longer reverb. So uh, if you're recording in a small space, you will still have reverb. It'll just be a different sounding reverb. Uh, but the bigger the room, the longer it's going to stick around, which could be very, very damaging to the clarity of your sound. Yes. The other thing, which I kind of already sort of mentioned, is if you have reflective surfaces in the room, like this wall behind me is painted drywall. That is a reflective surface. These windows in front of me that, may, that make me look very, very pretty when I'm on camera during the day uh, are also incredibly reflective. So, uh, you know, you want to avoid having things like that if you're going to be in a recording environment. And then the other big difference, uh, which can help mitigate some of this stuff, is as you can tell, I'm speaking literally like I'm about to eat this microphone. And part of that reason <laughs> is, is because of these materials and because of the size of the room. If I were to step away and if I'm doing my lecture and I'm talking like this, I'm assuming I can't hear myself right now through my speakers, but I'm assuming that you're hearing a pretty good amount of reverberation in the room in relation to my voice, uh, which A, is not pleasant. It'll get people tired listening to this for an hour. Uh, and B, it would, I would not consider this to be high quality sound and I can make it even worse by stepping a little further back. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if, again, if this was a studio and I had a lot of acoustic treatment in this space, if I really, really took care to absorb as many of these reflections as possible, I could actually get away with doing this and it'll actually sound okay, but not in this room. Um, in this room, I have to be upfront for you guys to get really, really good clarity out of the sound of my voice. Um, and I think, at least I would assume that's the situation that most people are in on an everyday well, basis. Well, and that, that also brings up a good point in that if you're using something like Zoom, for example, mm -hmm. they've added some cool features to improve your sound by putting some kind of, you know, stuff behind the curtain that you can just toggle on or off. But if the if you get further away from the mic, it's going to fight harder to process the sound. So you might get dropouts. It might sound choppy. So in addition to entering mm -hmm. the reverb of the space, entering that into the mic, you're also going to have some different kind of digital artifacts that are happening. So you want to make yeah. sure that you're close proximity to the mic without having plosives. And that's just with the distance thing, you can still be on the mic and 
not have plosives, which are when you get that pop of air from your consonant sounds, just by turning off axis a little bit. So that's why you're and I are eating the mic, but not eating it this way, because you get plosives right. when you do that. And, and there are solutions. If, if, if you're the kind of person that does not like having the microphone in the shot when you're talking to... Yes your colleagues or we're talking to somebody or recording something there are Laura will talk about some solutions to that um, I prefer being up close in the mic I have no problem I mean I, I work for sure so part of the part of my job <laughs> is to show sure products so here we yes. are uh, so I don't have a problem talking close into a microphone but I can understand other people might not be into that right yeah. so those are the three main causes for reverb but let's talk about some solutions now mm -hmm. that we've kind of gotten into that a little bit yeah okay so first one is going to be using a dynamic microphone, which we had talked about, if you remember from the beginning, the three types of microphones, because it takes a little bit more acoustical energy to make it actually happen and pick up. That's why a dynamic is great, especially if you're using one like this that has something called voice isolation technology, the MV7. But you want the dynamic microphone to have a cardioid pickup pattern, which we don't talk about much in this demonstration, but um, that's going to reject things coming in from the rear and the sides and the ceiling and the floor <laughs> for your microphone. So use a dynamic microphone. And the next one, which I just mentioned, use a cardioid microphone. Want to talk about the pickup pattern a little bit, Yuri? Sure. Yeah. So actually, uh, I have a real world example of this. Um, I was taking physics classes when COVID started. And I, I had the most awesome physics teacher. She was amazing. I would take any class with her ever, right? But when she was setting up at home, she had one of those really, really nice smart boards, like the clear, uh, the clear yeah. smart board. So she could like write on the board and then everything would be visible on the screen. And it was really, really cool. Um, but as a result of that, she was uh, moving around the room. She would be over here. She'd be over on the other side. She would be all over the place. So she needed a microphone that would kind of pick her up regardless of where she was um, at the same time uh, and be able to get the sound across. So she chose an omnidirectional microphone, which is a microphone that picks up sound from every direction. That's why it's called omnidirectional. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great. The downside of that was she was setting up her teaching studio in her basement where the oh. furnace was. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, so, yeah. So there were some really cool things about it. The, well, the coolest thing about it is that her cats would always join the lecture. So they would just always huh? jump on the table and they would chase her marker. She was writing that. That was really, really cool. But the downside is that it was not particularly high quality audio, um, yeah. especially when the furnace turned on because, I mean, me as an audio engineer, I'm like, oh, there goes the furnace, right? Yeah. You know, I'm always listening <laughs> for these kind of things. But it was really, really loud. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as saying that it, it overpowered her voice, but it did make listening to the lectures much more difficult because literally the furnace was right down there. So, you know, one of the solutions, if you're someone that doesn't need to walk around a lot, having a cardioid microphone, which is a microphone that essentially looks uh, as, as much as it can in front of the microphone, picks up a little bit off to the sides and it rejects everything coming into the rear microphone. So that's what I'm using right now. And that's what Laura is using the MV7 as well. Uh, and one of the main reasons I'm using it is again, because I am literally talking into a computer screen and then a bunch of windows. A right glass behind. window. I know. Not <laughs> great for those reflections we were talking right. about. But the thing is, you can't, you really can't hear much of the effect of the glass windows because this microphone is rejecting a lot of those reflections coming off, um, coming off the window. So that's another reason to use a cardioid mic. Um, mm -hmm. If you're the kind of person that needs to walk around and talk and be clearly heard, there's a solution for that as well that I'll get to in a moment. But in yes. most cases, if you're standing still and you're talking to people and you're not moving around, cardioid would be the number one choice. Yes. Then we talked about this a little while ago, but getting closer to the microphone so that you're not introducing any of the room or as little of the room as possible. So that's why, again, Yuri and I are eating the mics, as we say. And <laughs> so that's just one way of eliminating further reflections or reverberation. And this is the solution that Yuri just alluded to a minute ago. I mean, I could just talk from here, but I have a feeling that at about, I don't know, in about five or 10 minutes, people would get really, really annoyed hearing all of yes. the sound in my voice right now. So um, so let's say I do have to walk around. This is what one, one of my other teachers did. And I think this is a really, really good solution. This one, uh, there are budget solutions for this. I'm using a, more, a slightly more expensive one, but you can actually find very, very affordable ways to do this that we can probably talk about during the question and answer. But now I'm going to switch from this microphone right here to this microphone. Oh, we lost you, Yuri. Fun with audio routing. This is our live demo fun that we're trying to work through. You know what? I lost it. Oh, uh, no. My audio routing is not working anymore. And oh. I don't know why. Let's try this. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. There we go. 
Yep. Now can you hear me? Okay, beautiful. Software issue. All right. So here I am. Now I'm talking into the this lavalier microphone that's right in front of my face. And of course, this is ideal for somebody that wants to be able to be audibly heard anywhere. So I can actually take this microphone and I'm going to leave the room and I'm going to go <laughs> into my make kitchen a cup here. Coffee, you so know. Laura, I won't be able to hear you anymore, but you feel free to interrupt me and talk over me as much as you want. Yeah. So I'm just going to go into the kitchen here and <laughs> um, I'll just pour myself a glass of lemonade or something. Hold on. Yeah, so this is the benefit right of now, using Normally I would be singing a song right. while I do this, but right. you know, we're recording this and then there's going to be copyright things involved. So I'm just going to talk over <laughs> there. And I'm going to pour myself a glass of lemonade. As I'm lecturing, to a group of people in my classroom or in the webinar and stuff like Which that. Which we don't and recommend then necessarily. I'm gonna leave my kitchen. I think we've had enough of this and I'm gonna walk into here. And by the way, Laura was talking about condenser microphones earlier. I am actually speaking into a condenser microphone right now. So yes, yes. here I am. And I now I have my glass of lemonade. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so we don't recommend or endorse leaving your lecture actively to go into the kitchen to get a glass of lemonade, but hey, life gets in the way. But uh, the long and short of it is, if you want to have freedom and flexibility to move around and gesture and, and be in different parts of your room or your basement and away from the HVAC, that's mm -hmm. another possibility. So that's that's a head-worn option there. But the best solution, if you can do it, is to treat the room. And there are many companies out there where you can actually uh, send images of your room and they will spec it out for you. Now that's a top line solution, but if you are going to be doing this regularly, if you're recording in your room professionally, if you are broadcasting, live streaming, et cetera, it is worthwhile to look into some professional absorption mm -hmm. and acoustic treatments. So right. we can and, answer some of those questions too. And if you're the kind of person that is a DIY person, so if you want to build your own acoustic solutions, I'm going to tell you an industry secret right now. It's not really a secret, oh. but a lot of people think it's a secret. Um, so all of those fancy acoustic panels that you see on the market, not all, but almost all, they all use the same acoustic material. They and do. it's Owens Corning 703, which yes, is, you can pick it up at your local hardware store. <laughs> yep. So if you're the kind of person that likes to make their own stuff, you can make stuff just as effective as what the professionals make uh, for a lot less money if you know how to build it yourself. So yes. there you go. Or if you are a physics nerd like we are and you want <laughs> and you know where you can place them because that's the real key. I mean, you can get the materials, but it's knowing where to place it so that it's not just sticking things to the wall and hoping it sucks some sound up. So yeah, <laughs> anyway, absolutely. that's kind of the, the pricier option. But those other tips above will help you. Dynamic mic, mm -hmm. cardioid pickup pattern, get closer to the mic. And if you need to be moving around, wear a head worn. OK, room issue number mm -hmm. two outside of reverb are standing waves. And this main complaint is, why do I sound like I'm in a box? Or why is there a ringing sound when I talk? Which Yuri's gonna kind of demonstrate a little bit here. Yeah, of course. So here's what, what we're looking at right now here is a standing wave. If, if you're the kind of person that likes to theorize about things, you got this blue guy going from left to right, reflecting off the wall and coming back, that's the red guy going the other direction. And as they interfere with each other, the sound interferes with its own reflection. You can see the result is the black thing which is just a wave that stands in one spot. It's pretty cool, yeah. right? So this happens in every single room. Anytime you have two walls that are facing each other, uh, you're gonna have some wave that's gonna start bouncing back and forth in such a way where it just kind of stands still and it reinforces itself. Uh, normally you don't really pay attention to this stuff, but they exist in every single room and in certain rooms, it, became, it can become really, really problematic. Um, so for those of you that record in vocal booths, for example, this is one of the main reasons why I actually don't record in vocal booths um, and I don't advocate for recording in small closet type spaces. Because if you have a small closet type space, you're gonna have what we call a low frequency standing wave. And it's gonna sound something like this. Let me see if I can make this happen right now. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Here we go. So I am talking and... So you're gonna hear something like this. Can you guys hear that? Yes. So this is the boxy sound. This is the sound of me being in a room. And guess what? This is this is a standing wave that mm -hmm. I'm accentuating. So this is actually the effect of my room. And now that you hear it, you can't unhear it. And um, <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that you get when you're recording really, really small spaces. Um, there's actually a second one um, right here. Check, check, check. There it is. Uh, so you can hear this one. This is another low frequency standing wave in my voice. And then if you're in a room that is a little bit more reflective and maybe not 
small closet space, you might hear something like this, which is like a ringing in your voice. Um, you, you can do this. Yeah, I know it's gross, isn't Makes it? Makes my eyes water. <laughs> the funny thing is, uh, for those of you that are um, wondering what I'm doing, I'm literally taking my voice in the room. I'm talking to this microphone and I'm just raising the volume of these frequencies that are existing in the room. So I'm not actually changing my sound. I'm just making things louder. Uh, and here's another, uh, there should be a, a relatively high frequency standing wave here. Um, and so these exist in every single sound. And now that you've heard it, you probably won't be able to unhear it. So just to show you as an example, here's my voice without those standing waves accentuated. So this is my voice as, you, as you've been hearing it the entire time, right? That's this so is me. Nice. Is it a nice? But here it is. Here's my voice now with those standing waves um, removed. Ready? Oh, no, just kidding. So just a demo. Here's my voice as you've heard it before. Yep. And here's my voice with the standing waves removed. And now it's not, it should oh. sound considerably cleaner, right? So, and, you, and again, if you don't think about it, you don't pay attention to it, uh, this sounds like a normal voice. But now that you know that the standing waves are there, you can hear a very, very clear difference as to right. uh, my voice with the standing waves that are in the room and my voice with those standing waves removed, which takes me to the next point. There are solutions to this. You can, you can acoustically solve it if you want, but that requires you to change the walls in your room, which is probably not a good idea <laughs> uh, unless you want to get out your construction kits. That's a very, very expensive solution. Yeah. Um, unlike reflections and reverb, uh, putting up absorption in the room actually does not do anything for low frequency standing waves. It does affect high frequency standing waves. So, um, so the stuff that you heard, like this stuff right here, you can actually put up absorption and get rid of it. But the good news is, as you can tell, I'm killing this using a plugin in my software. So this is literally the process that I used. You can, this animation that you're seeing right here, mm -hmm. I find a standing wave, I turn it up until I hear it. And then when I find it, there it is. Then I just turn it down. So nice what do you mean simple. by when you say you till you hear it? Because some people who have never used EQ before would not know what that means. All right, perfect. So I am not a, a magical being. Uh, okay. I know a few people. Yes, you are, Yuri. You are a magical. <laughs> being. I, I, but I know a few people that can come into a room. There, there was an artist. I'm not. I don't think I'm allowed to say artist names in webinars. But there's an mm -hmm. artist that I worked with. She literally went. She was an acoustic guitar singer. She's amazing and very famous. Um, she she came into this uh, venue that I was working, starts playing her guitar and singing, and then she stops and goes, there's a standing wave at 247 hertz right here. Oh, wow. Come on. Like, That's crazy. Yes, yes, yes there is. <laughs> wow. So, I'm not, so I, I don't have that kind of talent. But um, what I'm doing and what this animation is showing is basically I take what we call a parametric EQ, which is, which is what you're seeing here, and I pick one frequency, and I just turn it up like crazy. Like, mm -hmm. which is what you're seeing here. And then I move it back and forth until I hear that ringing or that low boxy kind of sound that you heard before. And when mm -hmm. I hear that, that means that I have found a standing wave in the room. Uh, and just turn it off. When, when I do that, so <laughs> there, there's me sweeping it, looking, going, looking back and forth. Oh, I hear it, I found it, and now I turn it down. And awesome. It, it'll be gone. Much, much That's easier solution than putting up Equipment or putting up absorption for high frequencies or changing the, you know, the dimensions of your walls for low frequencies. Yes. And the main reason for doing this is not necessarily for your benefit. It's for your listener's benefit. It's for your students' benefit. Because if you're not monitoring yourself too, that's the other challenge. We want you to be wearing headphones while you're doing this. And oh, we should have said it at the beginning, Yuri. <laughs> Put on some headphones if you don't have them on already, people. I'm sorry, that was my bad. Um, but it's for your audience. If you don't do this kind of work and, and narrow in on the frequencies or use a microphone that's going to naturally work towards eliminating that, you're going to cause fatigue in your listeners. They're going to tune out. They're not going to want to be hanging on your every word of the lecture. So it's it's just another reason because they might hear it and, and misdiagnose it or say it's feedback or you know some sort of delay. And it's really not. It's just those resonant frequencies within the room. So this is a super handy tip for that. Right. And, and for those of you that are uh, recording music, keep in mind that these this is acoustic, so it doesn't matter if we're talking about somebody's voice or your musical instrument. It's going to be the same frequencies because it's based on the walls in the room. So right. uh, even more so if you're a drummer, if you're recording something really loud. So if you're doing drums or brass instruments or something that's just really, really going to bounce around the room, you're more likely to hear the effects of these standing waves. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we talked about reverb being a challenge or natural reverberation, standing mm -hmm. waves. And the third issue is noise. 
and we've all experienced this. I think this really demonstrates it beautifully, <laughs> especially if you're living in Chicago, like Yuri is. Yeah. So let's dig into this one, Yuri. So th this is, of course, the least fun one because getting rid of noise is a, a serious, serious challenge that uh, cannot always be solved. You know, as much as I like to say that every single acoustic solution can be can be mitigated, that's not the case with noise. And the main reason, um, if you go to the next slide, um, the main reason that uh, getting rid of noise is such a big problem is that it's the solutions to outside noise are very, very expensive. Um, the reason why is because now we're not talking about absorbing things that are in the room. You know, I'm speaking, it's bouncing off the walls. I use absorption or EQ to, you know, uh, knock it down a little bit. When you're talking about outside noise, you actually need to stop the sound from coming into your room. So at this point, this, this is what we call soundproofing. And a lot of people confuse the terminology be behind what soundproofing is, which is removing outside noise and capturing reverberation, which is the stuff that you're doing inside the room. Mm -hmm. So when you're soundproofing, trying to remove outside noise, really the only thing that works is putting a bunch of mass in front of it. And it and it's just simple physics. The more mass you put in, the less of it gets through the barrier into your room. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that means I need to have double pane windows. I need to have thick masonry walls i need to have double an anechoic chamber installed an in my chamber. yeah i need to yeah. <laughs> you know if you ever go into a studio you're going to notice that all of their doors are incredibly heavy and not only right. that they're also completely sealed because even a slight opening will allow just about all of that noise to to come in so yes. actual acoustic solutions to get rid of outside noise are incredibly expensive and require construction which um you know i can't afford and i'm sure a lot of other people cannot afford so really the only serious solution to get rid of noise is to literally try to isolate yourself the best possible. And again, going back to my physics, I hope my physics teacher isn't watching this right now. Uh, <laughs> but going back to my physics teacher, you know, teaching in her basement, the only way she can mitigate any of that noise is just by turning off the furnace, which, you know, right. yes, changes the temperature in the room. But if you're going to get a high quality recording, I've done it many, many times. Yeah, I've had musicians sweat. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, We've all yeah. suffered for our art in that regard. Yes, exactly. Um, the good news is if it's low frequency noise, so if it's a lawnmower outside or if it's uh, air conditioning hum from another room or your neighbor's footsteps in the ceiling, which are impossible to get rid of acoustically, uh, you can use something called a high pass filter, which is what you're seeing on the right side here, uh, to remove a lot of that stuff without affecting uh, the sound of your voice. Like For example, my voice, I don't have a particularly low voice, so I can usually make a cut at about 150 hertz and get rid of everything below 150 hertz and it does not affect the the sound of my voice really that uh that badly uh my filters can be tricky though yuri sorry to interrupt but yeah. explain what that is actually doing because some people so, mistake it so it can be tricky because uh I'll, I'll demonstrate it so i'm gonna put a high pass filter on my voice right now um so right now i'm cutting uh, about at 150 and you should be able to hear uh some change in my voice but if i do it too much then you're going to start hearing a thing out of my sounds voice, like a radio which, which is what you're hearing here yeah so now mm -hmm. i'm cutting out things that actually matter in my voice uh, so that's why i said and for my voice specifically 150 or so i'm at 150 right now you should still be able to get pretty good clarity and pretty good tone out of my voice um but if i go higher than that then we're starting to lose the beautiful, beautiful tones of my natural voice the, cutting out way too much. The tones of the your tones. Um, yeah. If you're a female, on average, uh, if you're if you're a female, on average, you can actually get away with cutting higher frequencies. Uh, in other words, moving this little gray bar that you see here further mm -hmm. to the right, um, which will only still... let certain frequencies pass, is what exactly. the idea being: high pass, low pass. Exactly. Yep. But yeah. the good news is, if, if you're able to do it, you know, the air conditioning hum is usually below 150 hertz. A vibration from another room is usually below 150 hertz. Mm -hmm. Outside engines and outside lawnmowers and other really like noisy, low frequency things will get removed just by using this high pass filter without affecting your voice. But Laura is 100% correct. Don't overdo it because then you're going to start affecting the frequencies that are in your voice. And that's just bad news. Yes. Um, and uh, the last thing I was going to mention is the good news about if you're doing web conferencing, uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, almost all of the web conferencing apps nowadays actually have pretty good noise suppression. Yes. Um, and I, I think I, uh, I, I actually use the natural noise suppression algorithm in Microsoft Teams when I'm doing meetings. I'm not using it right now. Um, and I'm not in Microsoft Teams, so it doesn't matter. But <laughs> Which is uh, what we live in daily. Just Exactly, I'm right? Sure, I'm sure some um, of you can relate. 
but the only downside of using the noise suppression software is it does actually in, in several ways affect the sound of your voice. Like if you're yes. doing a web conference or if you're teaching a class, no one's going to notice. And if they do notice it, probably nobody's going to care that much. But if you're doing a recording um, or if it's a music recording or whatever, you probably don't want to have the noise suppression software on because it will drastically affect the quality of your recording. Um, if noise is a problem, and I deal with this on a regular basis, I record in churches so much and churches make all sorts of noises so many noises um and you know i recorded a quartet like two weeks ago and there was air conditioning noise that i couldn't turn off because i'm not going to run around the church and turn off their ac mm. um and you know it's it's a hundred year old church so there's creaking noises there's all sorts of other like there's trucks driving by all that cool stuff so what do i do i can't remove the trucks right and i can't change the walls of the church there are some tools that are actually really inexpensive nowadays they used to be very expensive um the in posts meaning after you've done the recording you can actually go in and remove a significant amount of of mm -hmm. the background noise and all of those noise in your recording so luckily there are several tools um, that are available uh, on the market nowadays that can do this really really well in post-production and i use them professionally and that's actually good for post-production recordings for instruments but also for podcasting and mm -hmm. there's some for podcasting if you're doing any of your recordings ahead of time you can use some tools like descript which will go ahead and remove pops and clicks and ums and extraneous words that we all have if you're doing a podcast or speaking as a human um, so there are software things out there and tools that you can use uh, and the noise suppression to speak to that one specifically when yuri was off the mic a little bit ago the noise suppression, if you had that enabled in Zoom, would be fighting that. And that's where you'd get those dropouts that I was talking about because it's also employing a noise gate as part of the suppression. So if you have the noise gate, that's going to open up when you start talking to let you be heard and close when you're not. So you're not getting the HVAC or what have you in there. But if you're too far away, the noise gate is going to get really confused and try and open and close. And that's why you'll get dropouts. Yeah. So just something to think about and another reason to stay nice and close to the Absolutely. microphone. And as Cheryl mentioned in the very, very beginning of this webinar, uh, I went through these relatively fast and kind of, you know, uh, at, at a relatively basic level. If you think I've missed something or if you have a specific question that has anything to do with acoustics, uh, please do not be afraid to ask uh, at, yes. in, the, in the questions area and we'll be able to address it. Yes. In a little bit. So we've given you kind of a basic overview of which microphone types there are, some potential challenges if you are recording or broadcasting from home. And we wanted to show you, because it's a short presentation, just a few solutions that we've kind of alluded to throughout the presentation. Um, so specifically some microphones like this guy that we've been talking about, the MV7, which is really awesome if you're gonna be recording using USB. If you don't wanna have anything extraneous, you wanna be able to have a single solution, this is a fantastic option. And you don't have to use it like this. You can actually get the podcast kit, which comes with a Manfrotto tripod, so it can sit on your desktop. So this actually just, the whole yoke just flips around and it can stand up in front of you. Um, and you can use the software that we have, the Motive desktop software to control it which allows you to have more control over um, some of the EQ parameters, or you can put it into what's called auto level mode, which I have it in right now, and that automatically adjusts based on where you are related to the mic. And it has near mode and far mode. So if I wanted to be kind of off uh, a little bit more and have it not be on camera, I can do that as well. And so the benefit to this, the USB, is that it can plug directly into your computer and you can plug in that headphone that we're talking about. You need headphones if you're gonna be doing this so that you can hear yourself. And if you want to grow and expand, you can use the XLR output, which is right on the back right here, so that you can plug into an audio interface. So that's if you want to expand or have guests, if you're doing a podcast or record instruments, it's just a nice kind of flexible solution there. And then we also have several microphones, and this is an overwhelming slide, so we're not going to talk too much about it. But um, the MV5C, if you're doing conferencing or if you're doing presentations and you want something that's going to sit on your desktop, it's that top left microphone there, the little ball. Um, it's made for conferencing specifically. It's a USB mic. It overtakes the microphone in your computer. It has a headphone jack on the back and you can determine if you want to use it or don't want to use the headphones. You can monitor through the speakers in your computer. But that's a great one if you don't want the mic on camera, but you want to have the benefits of having it block out sounds coming in from the rear and the sides. So that's a really cool small low profile option it can sit on the desktop or on the stand that it comes with the mv51 to the right is a large diaphragm condenser this is a really great microphone if you have multiple applications if you're a musician a podcaster 
conference calls by day. It's really flexible. It's a large diaphragm condenser though. So like we talked about in the beginning, it's a little bit more sensitive to picking up sounds in the room. So just keep that in mind. If you have a less treated room, you might wanna go with a dynamic option as opposed to this, but it looks great, has five preset options, headphone monitoring on the back and tactile controls right on the front of the mic. Um, the MVL is the next one down, which is a little lavalier mic. This is really cool if you're plugging into a phone or a device and you wanna be able to have hands free. It's an omnidirectional mic, so it's going to, oh, sorry, is it cardioid? I think it's cardioid. <laughs> I'm saying this out loud. It's, it's a lavalier mic that's great for going into mobile devices. Clips right on and lets you be hands free and fancy free. And the MX-153, which Yuri's gonna speak to in just a second here, literally. Oh, and we can't hear, him, hear you again. It is an ear set head-worn omnidirectional mic for exceptional speech clarity, which just hangs right over your there ear. We there we go. It, it helps heard. turn on the transmitter when you're using a wireless microphone system. It does, yeah. it does. Sorry. Now, if you wanna have a, an ear-worn microphone like that and you don't wanna go wireless, you can get um, some XLR preamps that will actually let you go just XLR straight into an audio interface like this one, which is down on the bottom, the MVI. This is a single channel interface that lets you plug in your microphone or a guitar or an instrument. You can change presets here. So if you didn't want to go wireless, you could do that too. Yeah. And you might already have a mic kicking around the house. If you already have a, an SM58 or an SM57 or another dynamic microphone, if you get an interface like this, you can use that for your conference calls and you know rock out yeah. while you're giving your presentations <laughs> with Absolutely. that. And uh, the the MBL is a omnidirectional microphone. Thank you. You're I'm, welcome. And I, it, I don't know if Carol is still paying attention to us right now, but if she can jump back on screen for a second, <laughs> Carol, are you with us? There she is. Carol is speaking into one of our one of our live vocal mics that we use. This is like a really really fancy mic that you use for 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 live vocals on stage, and uh, she's using it as her conferencing mic. So I just wanted to show that off real quick. Yeah, this is a KSM 9HS. I added some extra Dazzle. bling to it because that's what I do. Um, and it is plugged into an MVI. Um, so the MVI is a super fun tool. Like you guys were saying, if you already have a microphone locker, if you're lucky enough like me to have a, to work for a microphone company and be a yeah. singer that likes to collect mics, um, I could use a different mic almost every day of the week. Um, but the uh, KSM 9HS has, has been a really nice ride or die. So very fancy condenser performance microphone um, on all of my conference calls. Why not? <laughs> Why not, right? Why not? And then the last one on there, and I promise I'll stop talking to you about gear and products, is the MV88 Plus, which is a stereo condenser mic. And it's the one on the far right, bottom right corner. And that one's great if you're going out in the field at all, or you want something that's going to be flexible and versatile, because using the Motive audio app uh, or video app, you can control the polar pattern of that mic. So it's a stereo mic, meaning you can hear the full stereo width. You can change it to cardioid, which is what this one is, and we talked about. Uh, mono bidirectional, which is a figure eight pattern. So that's great if you're doing interviews, you can set the microphone in between you and have one person on each side of the mic, or raw mid side, which is a great solution for doing some post-production editing. It comes with that whole kit that you see there. It's powered by your phone. So that's what that little phone clamp is in the middle and has a headphone jack on the back for monitoring. So you can use it on your desktop, you can use it in the field. It's great for content creation, podcasting, recording music, and conference calls. So that's kind of the, the spiel. You know, we try not to make this about sales at all. We wanna help you. So now it's question time. So hopefully you've got some things that we can answer for you. Cheryl, you have anything coming in? Uh, so far, we just have one question. I think you guys have answered everybody's burning questions and then some. Amazing. Uh, so here's the question. Um, I am mixing two mics and the MV7 in Audition. What's the best way to make them sound as similar as possible? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I mean, if you're using two mics, which two mics are they? Are they both dynamics? Two, two, two SM7Bs. Oh, two SM7Bs. I missed that. Wow. Sorry. Yeah. So there, I think what we're asking is how do we get the MV7 to sound as close to the SM7Bs? Oh, that is Period. a tough question. <laughs> I mean, the, the 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 very short answer is they're always going to sound a little bit different. Um, yeah. You know, they're not they're not the same microphone. But what you could probably do is is um, more or less kind of create what I would call a profile, which is like an EQ setting 
more likely on your SM7B to make it sound a little bit more like the MV7 than going the other way around. Um, I don't know, uh, without listening to them together, I don't know by ear exactly what those settings would be, but mm -hmm. you would probably uh, high pass filter all three of them. So the low frequency response of all of those microphones are going to be the same. And then I would adjust uh, using an EQ, having like a really, really wide curve like uh mm -hmm. so not not like the, the narrow resonance removal stuff that i was talking about earlier but but relatively wide um and kind of bump it up just a little bit on the sm7b to the point where it sounds similar to the mv7 because i think that's the the main physical difference between the two mics is that the mv7 is tuned specifically for vocals which means it has a little bit of a lift um on the high frequencies where the sm7b does not naturally have that you can make the sm7b have that um but, but if you use this, we can also, I mean, if you want to go the other way, I don't know if mm -hmm. this person's worked with the Shore Plus desktop app, but if you go over to manual mode, which I just switched it up to, mm -hmm. you have some more control features there and you have this EQ option down here. And these are actually coming directly from those same switches you have on the back of your SM7B. So yes. if nothing else, you could kind of mimic what you have already set up there as a starting point if you have the switches set to flat. Uh, and then you can kind of match and level set from within there, get your gain setting the same. Um, but I would recommend using the manual mode for MV7 as opposed to auto level. If you are going XLR, um, you won't have that same control, which you probably are. So then you'd have to go into your EQ, but you can actually see kind of what those um, patterns are in the manual for the SM7B on shore.com on our tech portal. Um, it'll show you what those actually mean from an EQ perspective. So you could mimic it that way. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the, the third thing I would add to that is um, I, I'm assuming that you use, if you're recording three microphones and it's for like a podcast or something, um, you're probably using some level of compression, mm -hmm. um, a, a good amount of compression and the same compressor settings on all three microphones will actually do quite a bit. So I, I'm not saying put three in, individual compressors, but compress all three signals at the same time. Yeah. Using, like, so I'll put all three signals to a stereo track or a mono track of their own, <laughs> then put yeah. a compressor on that track. Yeah. So you're, you're working on all three channels at the same time. Um, and then apply the same compression on all three signals. And actually that will do quite a bit to make them sound much more similar to each other. All right. Awesome. Great advice. Thank you so much. Great um, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, but I do want to add, if you do have a question that pops in your mind, or if you have a question that's maybe not related to this topic so much and you, but it's burning a hole in your, in your brain, um, you can go to sure.com slash contact. Um, there's a form there that if you fill it out, you can kind of enter in all of your details and you will get put in touch with our support team. And we have an amazing team of applications engineers that can answer so many topics across all sorts of audio questions. So sure.com slash contact, it's a great place to go. Um, if you just need to talk to somebody and get some support, we have an amazing support team. Um, in addition to that, we also have a really um, extensive FAQ on our website. Um, if you yes. search our website for the FAQ, thousands upon thousands of audio questions that have already been answered. Um, so feel free to go to our FAQ, search around there, uh, sure.com slash contact to get in touch with our support team. They are just very, very knowledgeable can, and can help with so many different things. We also um, have a spot to look that's kind of new. Uh, if you have questions and you're more of a visual person, we started a series last September called How Do You Do That? So if you go to our Shore YouTube channel under Creators, you can find the playlist called How Do You Do That? And that'll show you a bunch of cool videos that answer some quick hit questions that come from our find and answer section that Cheryl just man, uh, mentioned. And Yuri and I do the videos, another guy named Paul McWhorter, who's fantastic, uh, Mario Ponce, and yeah, we have a great time. So check that out. Thanks so much for bringing those up, Laura. They are fantastic videos. Um, I'll say that as somebody that doesn't create them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We like them. All right. All right. I think that just about wraps it up. Thank you so much to Laura and Yuri today. What a great presentation. Lots of great information. I hope you learned a little something. I know I always do. And we hope to see you on the next webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>